Let's introduce the fourth quantum number, intrinsic spin. In 1921, Arthur H. Compton was studying the scattering of x-rays from crystal surfaces. He concluded that the electron itself, spinning like a tiny gyroscope, is probably the ultimate magnetic particle. We cannot use the analogy of the electron spinning like a top literally, since an electron is considered to be a structureless point particle described as a wave. It can be said that elementary particles carry extrinsic angular momentum, which we have called capital L, as well as intrinsic angular momentum, which we will call S. What conclusively demonstrated the existence of intrinsic spin in electrons was the stern gerlach experiment. It was performed in 1922 by German physicists Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach. It was an experiment where silver atoms, which have one lone frontier electron, were emitted from a source, collimated, and then sent through a non-uniform magnetic field orientated in the z direction. Half of the silver atoms bent up, and the other half bent down. This showed that the total angular momentum of these particles was equal to one half. This was not allowed due to constraints on the solution to the Legendre differential equations that said that L must be equal to an integer. Other such irregularities, in addition to the stern gerlach result, included why do all electrons in a system not populate the ground state, or any other single state? It was also observed that certain transitions had two very closely spaced lines, called doublets. The most used example of this is the sodium D-line spectrum. In 1925, Wolfgang Pauli proposed that an electron can exist in two distinct states, one-half and negative one-half. This fourth quantum number is called the spin quantum number, using S as the letter to define it. It does not appear before in our formulation because relativistic effects were not considered, and in the early 1930s, Dirac developed a relativistic extension of quantum mechanics where spin appears naturally. On this slide, we are comparing the notation between extrinsic spin, or angular momentum, and intrinsic spin to show that their operators are very similar. We can define operators which determine the spin state. We have already seen those for angular momentum, and the standard operators L squared and Lz are written here being applied to the angular solutions to the hydrogen atom. For the intrinsic spin, we can construct the same operators, total spin squared denoted as S squared, and the z-component of spin, denoted as s said. Analogous to angular momentum, the value of spin is one-half, while the z-component can only be plus or minus one-half. We will let alpha represent a state where the electron is in the spin-up configuration. So applying s-hat to alpha means that we returned h-bar squared times one-half times one-half plus one alpha. The z-component of spin applied to the alpha returns one-half h-bar alpha. Beta represents a state where the electron is spinned down. This means we get the same value as with alpha when s squared is applied, meaning that the total intrinsic spin is the same, while the z component is now negative h-bar over 2. Alpha and beta are normalizable over all spin states, which is what the two integrals at the bottom are representing. In this lecture, we discuss the Zeeman effect and intrinsic spin. In relation to the Zeeman effect, since electrons are traveling around the nucleus, if atoms are put into a magnetic field, their magnetic dipoles will change the energy of the state to include a term that depends on the m quantum number. In relation to intrinsic spin, this fourth quantum number has values of plus or minus h-bar. This type of angular momentum was demonstrated to exist by the stern gerlach experiment, and this result naturally falls out of quantum mechanical theory when relativistic effects are taken into account.